With very good afternoon to everyone. I welcome you all to uh, 13th Dr. Sujay B. Roy oration uh, organized by Department of Cardiology uh, at Ames, New Delhi. Uh, to begin the proceeding, I request our Honorable Director to welcome the orator of the day, uh, Dr. Ravasan Srini Ramchandran, who is uh, Chief at uh, Boston University of uh, Medical School, uh, USA. Put you on mute. Do you want to be on mute? Thank you. Good afternoon, and I'd like to take this opportunity first to welcome all our senior faculty members who have joined online. It's indeed a pleasure to see all of them uh, today, and I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences to really welcome them on uh, this oration the 13th Dr. Sujoy B. Roy oration. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have the orator being someone who is actually from the Institute itself, Dr. Vasan S. Ramachandran, who's an Amazonian and has done very well and made not only the Institute proud, but uh, has also made the country proud of the work that he's done. So it's indeed a pleasure for all of us to really welcome the orator today, and I would really take this opportunity to thank the department for holding this oration in these trying times. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Professor Anita Saxena, who is head of the Department of Cardiology, Chief of Cardiac Science Center and Dean Academic, to introduce uh, Dr. Sanjay Biroy. Thank you. To all my esteemed seniors, it's really an honor and a pleasure to speak in front of you. Good afternoon. Uh, I would just like to give a brief uh, introduction to Dr. Sujay B. Oration. Everybody knows him very well. I think all of us have heard about him. Some of you might have actually worked with him. So Dr. Roy is the founder head of the Department of Cardiology, an eminent cardiologist born in Myanmar and graduated at Rangoon University. And after that, he went on to do his postgraduate studies at, uh, at, at a study, university in Edinburgh and Boston. And then he moved over to Harvard as a member of its medical faculty. When he was on the faculty of Harvard University, the uh, late Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, then health minister of India, actually invited him to come to India and to head the newly created Department of Cardiology at the Ordinary Institute of Medical Sciences. So he returned to India, took up the position of head in 1958. Apart from training a number of students in cardiology, Dr. Roy made a significant contribution towards the understanding of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease in India. His work on high altitude cardiorespiratory problems, which helped in the maintenance of troops in the Himalayas, has been widely acclaimed. He was a senior fellow of the Armed Forces Medical Research Council and also a member of Cardiovascular Expert Committee of the World Health Organization. He had published over 150 scientific papers in very reputed journals, and it was under his leadership that the cardiology department developed into a modern cardiac care facility where he performed the first cardiac catheterization in 1962 in India. Dr. Roy was a recipient of numerous national and international awards. To mention a few, the Amir Chand Basanti Award, the Fiki Award in 1976. He was also awarded the Padma Bhushan, one of the highest awards by the President of India. Unfortunately, he died rather young on 25th March 1976 in New Delhi. But we all will always remember him. All his colleagues, all his students who are all over the world would always be missing him and remembering him. To commemorate the services of late Professor Sujoy B. Roy, the department faculty in 1976 meeting decided to create a fund called the Sujoy B. Roy Memorial Fund for an institution of this oration with the voluntary donations by friends, admirers, colleagues, and a handsome contribution by government of Mauritius. Dr. Roy, Dr. Sujoy B. Roy Award is given to Indians as well as foreign nationals who have contributed in the field of cardiology or related sciences. And we have had real stalwarts who have given this oration earlier, including Dr. William Roberts, Dr. Castaneda, 
Dr. Gary Rubin, Dr. Sloman, Dr. Masood Akhtar, Dr. Edward Rowland, Dr. Emil Bhatia, Dr. Rajendra Tandon, Dr. Jagat, Jagat Narula, Dr. Uh, Robert Henry Anderson, Dr. Anderson, who gave it last time. We are truly honored to have Dr. Vasan Ramachandran, one of our own alumni, to deliver this oration today. And I will now request Dr. Kothari to formally introduce Dr. Vasan. My teachers on the Zoom, Director, Dean, Dr. Bhargav, colleagues and friends, it's indeed my very pleasant duty and a privilege to introduce Dr. Vasan S. Ramachandran. There are many people on YouTube which, who may not be knowing Dr. Vasan very well, although the people on Zoom know him very well, so I would venture to get into some details. Professor Vasan is a professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and is a chief section of preventive medicine and epidemiology. He is also the PI and the director of the famous Birmingham Heart Study, with which he is, in, he is associated for the last 25 years or so. He is the founding member of the, and the leader of the International Ecogen Consortium and is well recognized internationally for translational research in cardiovascular epidemiology. Dr. Vasan is an alumnus of AIMS and is did his undergraduation and post-graduation and super specialization in cardiology training here at AIMS. And after a brief stint as a faculty of AIMS and also faculty of Archuta Menon Center in Trivandrum, he chose to go to US for further systematic study. His systematic study of ECHO in ARF while as a resident is still a landmark article. His subsequent career in US can be briefly summarized in three words, Veni, Vidi, Vici. As he can say, I came, I saw, and I conquered. Because he, progressed, he progressively conquered all the academic fronts in his chosen field. His research spans a wide variety of domains and designs. He has worked in the area of genetic and non-genetic epidemiology of heart failure, systolic and diastolic heart failure, hypertension, population standards, normative data, biomarkers, CVD risk estimation, all the omics, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and whatnot. He has been an associate editor of most prestigious cardiology journal circulation for 10 years. And he was also the first editor of cardiovascular circulation, cardiovascular genetics. He has contributed immensely to the science he has published more than 875 papers and is rated among the top 1% cited by Thomas Reuter for the last consecutive 10 years. Amongst the top 1% cited researchers and also among the top 0.01% cited researchers by PubMed. Over the year, he has been endowed with J.N. Louis Kaufman Chair of Professor of Vascular Medicine in Boston. In sum, Professor Watson is a shining star in the firmament of academic cardiology. And above and beyond that, those who know him personally are wonderstruck by his simplicity, by his compassion, and by his conscientiousness. In one of the letters to editor decades ago, Dr. Vasan wrote, he quoted a couplet from Robert Frost, we dance round in a circle, we dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. Over the years, I believe, he has made some inroads into towards the secret of the atherosclerosis. And this afternoon, he has chosen to share some of his thoughts regarding the fundamental concepts of CVD risk. Over to Professor Vasan, please. Thank you, Dr. Kothari, Dr. Saxena, and colleagues. I'm humbled to be over here in front of my teachers and to be able to speak with you. It's an emotional moment for me. So bear with me as I proceed. I thought I would talk and crystallize in about 45 minutes some of the big picture things I've learned over the last 30 years. That's why I call the title of my talk, Fundamental Concepts of Cardiovascular Disease Risk, a view with a microscope. I want to begin by acknowledging my alma mater and I want to pay homage to this beautiful child who grew up to be a phenomenal human being. I want to begin by acknowledging Rajkumari Amritkar, who founded my alma mater, where I spent 15 years learning a lot of what I am today. That's the laying of the 
Foundation of All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. And on the left-hand side, you see Manorville, uh, a small palace that she gifted to Ames, where I had the good fortune as an undergraduate to spend a few days in Shimla. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Sujoy B. Roy, whom some of us have not met. It's true that a lot of people touch us in our lives whom we have never met. And they are the dreamers who teach us and who inspire us to actually dream. And what you see in the center of the slide is a landmark article of his, which still stands today as a paper which is recommended to all fellows in cardiology. And at the lower part of the slide in the center, what you see is the education and mission of Dr. Roy, the Center of Excellence he founded. And the birds that you see fly are the ones who graduate and populate the country locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. I also want to begin with a note of the deepest gratitude to people who supported me and taught me during my stay, especially during my DM in cardiology. The center you see Prakash Chandnegi and Tarun Dave. We were a threesome that endured a pretty difficult times in a sense of hard work. I want to acknowledge the four senior residents who actually inspired me when I was a medicine resident. And two of them are on this call, Dr. Kothari, Dr. Jagat Narula, Dr. Hariharan, and Dr. G.S. Kalra. One could not have asked for a better entree into cardiology. I want to acknowledge the teachers who taught me. And they taught me much more than cardiology. Starting from the lower left-hand side panel, Dr. Wazir, who taught me the importance of empathy when it comes to dealing with patients. Madam Shivasta, who inspired with hard work and discipline. Dr. Manchanda, who's on this call, who taught the importance of scientific thinking in clinical research. Dr. Sinath Reddy, who inspired me into epidemiology and also taught me how to use puns cleverly during talks. Dr. K.K. Talwar, who taught me the importance of always smiling and collaborating. Dr. V.K. Behel, who taught me the importance of having a healthy dose of skepticism throughout life, including in science. I want to acknowledge Madam Saxena. I want to, for inspiring me about the highest quality of care that one can provide to one's patients. Dr. Call who taught me the importance of creativity, and Dr. M. L. Bhatia, who inspired us for the highest standards of academic cardiology. Above and beyond all these, I want to acknowledge Professor Rajan Tandon, who taught me not only cardiology, humanity, but life, care, and love. Moving on with my talk. There are four basic messages, and this is mainly for the people in the YouTube. If after this slide, you want to take a break and leave, you would probably not miss a lot. And these are the four things, four main points I want to emphasize. That when we talk of cardiovascular disease risk, it is best understood using a transdisciplinary lens and a multi-level framework. Disease risk, including cardiovascular disease risk, nests within biological and sociological hierarchies, which are complex adaptive systems. And I'll unpack that term for you. The determinants of disease in individuals is not the same as the determinants of disease in populations. An important point to bear, again, which I will elucidate upon. And last but not the least, the determinants of disease in populations is not equivalent to the determinants of disease in its vulnerable segments. So there are four parts of my talk. I begin by sharing with you some epidemiological concepts about what do we mean when we really mean risk, an epidemiological and statistical view, then segue into a question I've been most interested over the last 30 years, why? do people develop risk factors in the first place? And then towards the end, I want to share with you the explosion of new measures of disease risk and try to place them in that appropriate perspective. 
And I want to end by synthesizing these four points into possibly a coherent message for the young trainees. So the essence of clinical medicine is this question on this slide. Why is this person sick at this time, at this place, and in this context? So when you see a person with chronic stable angina at the CT center, this is one of the things to think about. An important corollary is, could it have been prevented? And if so, how so? And just to elaborate on this theme, which we refer to as the person, time, place, context dynamic, I share with you three vignettes. A 60-year-old woman in Kochi, Kerala, was a BMI of 32 kilogram per meter square overweight, presents to her primary care doctor with a fasting blood sugar of 130 milligrams per deciliter. In the northeast part of the country, a 45-year-old man from Guwahati has a BMI of 24 kilogram per meter square, has a fasting blood sugar of 130 milligram per deciliter, and goes for a routine health checkup in the facility. And to round off some of the corners on the left-hand side, a 35-year-old man in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, who's obese, has a BMI of 32 with a fasting blood sugar of 130 milligram per deciliter. All these three individuals that physicians see in their outpatients have the same diagnosis, type two diabetes. They're the same diagnosis. Do they have the same disease? The same biochemical diagnosis, but do they have the same disease? Recall that the woman from Kerala who has a BMI of 27, the overweight range, reaches the threshold, crossing the threshold of 126 when she's 60 year old. The 45 year old man has normal BMI and crosses the threshold at a much younger age. And the man from Gujarat who has a BMI of 32 crosses the threshold at an even younger age of 35. These three individuals have the same biochemical diagnosis. They may not have the same underlying disease processes. Let me add some additional information which may, might help you answer the question, will the disease type two diabetes behave the same way in all three individuals? The 60 year old woman in Kochi is a headmistress a desk job, and she cycles to work. The 45-year-old man in Assam is picking tea leaves in a tea garden and works physical labor eight hours a day. And the 35-year-old man in Ahmedabad is a merchant, a cloth merchant, who is on the shop floor. This disease will not behave the same way in all these three individuals because of what we refer to as context. And that will be an important theme of my talk. So what do we really mean by context? And let me indulge you with an, a trip down ecology. What you see on the left-hand side of this slide is the Great Lakes area of the United States. And this is a very nice book recommended for people in case you want to read it, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you see a biologist, Sonia Santui, in 1988. So Sonia, with two of her friends, was on just a summer boating trip in Lake St. Clair. That's about a 24-mile aneurysm of water that connects Lake Erie and Lake Huron. And on that fine summer day, she put her hand into the water and came up with a shell that looked like this, a striped shell. She sent it to the University of Guelph, just outside Toronto. And it came back that this was a zebra muscle. It's got stripes of a zebra. This was not found in those days in the Great Lakes region. And what you see over here on the left-hand side of this slide is in orange, the zebra muscles as they are increasing in their population. And fast forward by 2002, you see purple dots because the cousin of the zebra muscle, the quagga muscle, the quagga muscle, quagga stands for the antelope, uh, historic extinct antelope. There are apparently seven of these in University College London skeletons are available, uh, but it's a hardy muscle. 
And what you can see over a period of time is that the orange and the purple dots have proliferated. And what happened to the Great Lakes is that in summer, often they are what's called as vodka clear, deep blue, very clear. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Because what has happened is that these two muscles have proliferated much more the quagga because it goes down to a very great depth. And that's because it destroys the ecosystem and the phytoplankton. So these two muscles, the reason they came into the United States is because of the ships that came from Europe. And as they enter the Great Lakes region, they empty the ballast. So this muscle came in through the ships. And in the 2000s, there was a powerful movement in the Great Lake regions called Stop the Salties because these saltwater ships that came actually populated these waters with an organism that has been extraordinarily destructive to the Great Lakes ecosystem. How is it destructive? And you see in the lower part of this, the quagga mussel really proliferates and hangs on to everything so that your sheets of these mussels that are occupied over here. An important thing to remember that this quagga mussel actually is native to the Baltic region in Eastern Europe. And here's an example of the Dniper in Ukraine where it is there. It's a harmless muscle. It does nothing over there because it is kept in check by the ecosystem. So are these muscles, have the biological name Dracaena, harmless marines or are they a rogue species? Perhaps the difference between these two behaviors is one of context. We'll come back to this, but let me move on with this talk and talk about what exactly we mean by risk. Risk by the Merriam-Webster dictionary refers to the possibility of loss or injury or a hazard. The three other terms which are important that I want to talk about as we talk about this, and they refer to the notion that we often have in epidemiology, and these are terms used by actually economists, fortune. Fortunes are, refers to things that are out of your control, things you're born with, wealth, your genome. Chance, the response to something you do. This is more deterministic, a view that maybe you can influence some things that happen in your life. Luck, that refers to the notion of you do something and you may succeed or you may fail. That can be a random stochastic process. And all these three concepts play into our notion of risk, as I shall share. This next slide defines risk in the classic epidemiological way. It's the probability of having an event over a specified period of time, allowing for competing risks. An alternative term that's often used is hazard. It's the instantaneous rate of an event conditional on being at risk at a given time. Incidence density is when you average hazard over a period of time. Lifetime risk, when you average that hazard over a lifetime. When we talk of risk, it's important to understand two related concepts, variability and uncertainty. Variability in our chances that we'll be exposed to something. Variability in our susceptibility to exogenous factors. Variability in our susceptibility to endogenous factors. And this variability is what explains why people differ within a community. And it also explains why people differ within themselves over a period of time. Uncertainty refers to the humility where we acknowledge that we really do not understand fully what mediates risk. And there's always noise around our estimates that we refer to as confidence intervals. And there's a notion of uncertainty increasing with time, as I shall explain. From a global burden of disease perspective, there are additional terms that are used, and it's good to know these terms. Theoretical minimal risk refers to the risk you would have of any disease, say cardiovascular disease, in a world when an exposure is non-existent, a world without tobacco, for example. That's the counterfactual situation. So the risk of cardiovascular disease in a world where there is no smoking refers to the, what is possible if we eliminate smoking totally. Plausible minimal risk is the distribution of an exposure among what's really possible and such that the population risk is minimized. 
in terms of cardiovascular disease, you could turn to some of the primitive tribes, the Yanomamo Indians in Brazil, the farmers in the Yellow River in China. That's what we could do in terms of lowering the risk. Feasible minimal risk is actually refers to what has existed or can exist or is feasible in our experience over time. And what epidemiologists often use is the last one, which is cost-effective minimal risk. That's the bang for your buck. How much can you intervene in a way that you lower risk and it's still cost-effective? So this is the notion of risk from a different perspective, which brings in cost-effectiveness. Another important concept as we see our patients is to remember that we often use the profile to estimate individual risk. Individual risk is very hard to estimate. And what that individual risk actually represents, it's based on a central premise that that individual risk represents the average risk experienced by a group of similar people. And it's important to understand this because in terms of epidemiology, while we talk of high risk individuals, most people in the short run actually have very low risk. Most people will not have an event, even if they have a high risk profile. And it's important to put this in perspective, take 100 high men for very high risk, a five year CBD risk of 10%, a 10 year CBD risk of 20%, that qualifies as high risk. And imagine the best therapy you have, which lowers that risk by 50%. What this actually means is that of these 100 men, if you follow them for five years, 90 will not develop disease. Nine out of 10 will not develop disease, even though they are high risk. And among the 10 who are destined to develop disease, five can be prevented by our best treatment, but five will occur despite treatment. So that just puts in perspective and helps us avoid false reassurance of our patients when we talk about treating high-risk individuals. Now, let me move on to this basic question of why do people develop risk factors? And this is a journey, and I'll walk you through this journey. And what I have done over here is, across the various decades from 1960 onwards, picked one or two landmark concepts that are paradigm shifting in our understanding of CBD risk. And I begin with Framingham, the classic paper by Bill Cannell and his colleagues in 1961 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, where they identified what they referred to then as factors of risk, perhaps not a very wise choice of words. And they identified age, sex, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and LVH as factors of risk. Fast forward, Bill Cannell popularized the notion that there's a multifactorial origin of cardiovascular disease. What you see on this slide is a 10-year probability of cardiovascular coronary heart disease in people, all of whom have the same cholesterol level, all of whom have the same age, 40 to 43. And the gray bars are women, the red bars are men. And you can see a five-fold variation in the rates. Although they all have the same cholesterol, they're the same age. And that's related to the concomitant burden of additional risk factors. The more you add this baggage, the higher the risk becomes. And this gave rise to the notion of multivariate risk and multivariate formulations. And this is one of the early papers that introduced this concept. And fast forward, this became the Framingham risk score. Fast forward even more in 2013, this morphed into the pooled cohort equation, which has greater applicability to diverse cohorts. So that is the biomedical model of risk. And this is the sandbox in which I played a lot. But I want to take you through some other perspectives as well. Who are we as homo sapiens? And this is a landmark paper by Boyd Eaton and his colleagues, where they refer to mankind as stone agers in the fast lane. That's because what we are supposed to be doing is actually having leaves around our abdomen and walking around plucking berries and eating raw meat. But that's not what we do. We eat a very different diet, lead a very different lifestyle. Then the obvious question is, why isn't humankind evolved to deal with this lifestyle? And then chronology becomes important. So what this part of the slide shows is that if we look upon the existence of Homo sapiens as a 12 month period from January 1 to December, and imagine that today is the last day of December, then the people in this room have been around for somewhere around 10 minutes or so. In fact, the industrial 
revolution happened just about an hour ago. The agricultural revolution happened about a day ago. That just tells you that the rapidity of progress that we have undergone has really not given time for evolution of the hunter-gatherers to deal with the lifestyle that we have. From the evolutionary and the anthropological perspective, I want to talk about another perspective on risk. And for this, we have to go back over a century, uh, 1890s, Paris, Emile Durkheim, he was a sociologist, and he referred to the notion of social facts. In a sense, what he was saying was that individual behavior, that's what we counsel our patients about, they can only be understood in the historical, cultural, and social context in which it occurs. Very abstract thought, but this was further developed, fast forward a century, by Sir Anthony Giddens, who called it structuration theory, very popular in sociology. And Sir Anthony Giddens introduced two terms, social structure and agency. Agency is the ability of individuals to actually impact their lives. And social structure is what determines that ability. And this structuration theory also talks about four kinds of resources. And people who do not have access to these resources are excluded from that notion of agency. They have no control over what happens to them. And these resources could be material, wealth, knowledge, could be cultural, practices, social networks, or it could be political. So hang on to this because this will come back again in this thought. Fast forward into 1970s, one of the paradigm shifting developments was what was referred to as the Lalonde framework. Mark Lalonde was a Canadian health minister. And what you see on this slide is one of the first times that health was portrayed outside the medical sphere the importance of not only human biology, but also of environment and lifestyle and bringing in the notion of health promotion. Fast forward another decade, and we have this famous paper. It's a landmark paper, which I read almost every year without fail. Sick individuals and sick populations, where Sir Jeffrey Rose wrote brilliantly, etiology confronts two distinct issues. The determinants of individual cases they are the people we see in our outpatients. And the determinants of incidence rate, that's what happens in the population. And that spawned the classic notion that we can screen the high-risk people who have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar. But it might be important to also move the population distribution because the impact of minor shifts in population distribution, in this case, as you see, systolic blood pressure, can have major consequences for reduction in cardiovascular disease rates. And in part, the notion of the shift is the fact that a lot of these events occur among people who have average levels of risk factors. So this is the classic two approaches, which are complementary, the population-based approach where you shut off the tap that produces the risk factors, and the high-risk approach where you screen the people who already have risk factors. And it's been tongue in cheek referred to as the Dr. Mop approach. So among the various epidemiological pearls Jeffrey Rose came up with, one was the notion of diffusion of risk. And this is an important concept. In a society, when a risk factor is so widespread, it can obscure causation. In the United States, we deal with this often in the context of overweight and obesity. It's so common that one could ignore the fact that it might be the fundamental precursor of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar. I already referred to the notion of most cases occurring close to the population average, because that population average may not really be normal, even though it's distributed normally. And the last pearl I want you to remember is the notion of the prevention paradox, which is the essence of the challenge cardiovascular prevention faces that the notion of shifting the population distribution means we ask people to do a lot at an individual level or very little gain at an individual level. And that's the prevention paradox. Fast forward another decade, Professor A.J. McMichael in Australia came up with a landmark article in the American Journal of Epidemiology where he referred to prevention as prisoners of the proximate. And what you see over here in this cage is the proximate, is the Framingham biomedical model. 
And Professor Michael reminded us that this biomedical model might be ignoring with its focus on individual and the proximate, what's really happening in the population, what's really happening before the risk factors and what really happens over the life course. Very powerful concept. Around about the same time in 1990s, the CDC came up with the notion of what's called as syndemics or synergistic epidemics. The mutually reinforcing and co-clustering of risk factors, which Bill Cannell had described in his Bill Cannell plots, but also syndemics point to what we refer to as environments of risk. And so when we see our patients and we talk to them about why they need to do, what they need to do, how soon they need to do it, some of the anthropologists have reminded me that that's what is actually called as risk factor shaming. It doesn't mean your advice is incorrect. It means that we might be making what's referred to as a fundamental attribution error, the tendency to blame people instead of the system that generates that profile. I want to segue from this notion to talking about another landmark report that deals with risk. And this is the black report in the United Kingdom. This was generated in the 1980. And this landed in the uh, desks of the uh, Thatcher government and the Tory government had little interest in actually um, reading this report or looking upon its um, messages. But you see a series of reports came for the, the black report, the Atkinson report, and all of them were pointing at one thing, that maybe there is some association of risk with social class. And finally, in the report by Michael Marmot, he said it elegantly, health inequalities and the social determinants of health are not just a footnote to the determinants of health. They are the main issue. And what you see on this slide is the classic example from British civil servants. And you see a clear social gradient of risk in terms of mortality. But this same time, Merv Susser and his colleagues in New York started talking about the socio-ecological model. And they started moving us from the notion of individual risk, the biomedical model, to the notion that perhaps the risk individuals experience is related to their social relations, to their living conditions, to their neighborhoods, to their communities, to the policies. And he referred to this notion of moving from the black box to the notion of the Chinese boxes, a box within a box. And fast forward, um, a reiteration of the same by Nancy Krieger at Harvard, referred to as the eco-social model. And she brought in and married this notion to the structuration theory by referring to agency. The eco-social model of health talks about, do individuals have the power over their circumstance and the power to actually implement the changes, lifestyle changes that we tell our patients to actually adopt. So at this point, I want to step back and revisit the notions that I began with fortune, chance, and luck and link it to the eco-social model and a little bit to the notion of health inequities. And what you see on the lower part of the slide are actually scenes from the Boston Marathon. It begins at a town called Ashland, a few miles from Framingham. And imagine this is a marathon. It's about a 24 mile race. Imagine, and it begins typically in the morning, on, uh, typically in, uh, in uh, spring. Uh, imagine the Boston Marathon or any marathon. And imagine that people are starting at the start line. Imagine some people who actually are five miles behind the start line. And the race begins. What are the chances that somebody who's so behind will actually catch up? That being behind is fortune. Chance is their ability to catch up and luck is do they catch up or not? And this brings in the notion of CVD risk evolving in what actually is a life marathon. I will link this further to the notion of life course as we move on, but I want to pause for here and refer to how the World Health Organization adopted this model of social determinants of health. And this includes cardiovascular health. And what you see on the left-hand left side is they bring in policy. They bring in macroeconomic policies, social policies, public health policies, cultural policies. And then they bring in socioeconomic position. That was the notion which Michael Marmot introduced. And then they bring in the healthcare system 
and then they talk about inequities. And an iteration of the same social determinants of health used to explain health inequalities in a much broader context. And all this plays out over the life course. The notion of how we begin, how risk evolves, how access to health, how access to knowledge, access to resources, agency, play into health inequalities. So I want to pause here and take you back to the notion of when does risk really begin? Cardiovascular disease risk. Does it begin when you're born? If you listen to the Barker hypothesis, it begins before you're born. And what you see on this slide is observations at Hertfordshire that infants who were born with low birth weight actually ended up being more obese, having more diabetes, and having higher rates of cardiovascular disease. And that brought into the notion of cardiovascular disease the importance of fetal programming. And fast forward a few years, there was further reiteration and greater attention being paid to the notion of fetal health, infant health, child health. And I want to pause here for this insert because there is a transgenerational element. Imagine a woman pregnant with a daughter. Now that daughter has ovaries, which will represent future grandchildren. So in a sense, the in utero health that the daughter is experiencing, what the mother is doing at that time is impacting not only the daughter, but a future grandchild. And it turns out that it's not just when the mother is pregnant, it turns out that the health of the husband and the mother, even before they conceive, actually plays into the risk of the unborn child, the unconceived child. And that's the notion of the life course disease. It actually begins before you're born. It begins with what your parents do. It begins with what your mother and father do when the mother is pregnant. It begins with what happens in infancy. And this evolved into what Professor Ben Shlomo in Bristol called the life course epidemiological approach. The notion that cardiovascular disease actually evolves over the life course. And a corollary of this is that prevention needs to happen exactly over the life course, uh, beginning with healthy young adults who are in the reproductive age group, healthy maternal and child health, healthy adolescents, healthy young adults, and that's the way it works. I want to, at this point in my talk, again, digress and bring in an orthogonal concept, one of what's referred to as complex adaptive system. And what does that have to do with risk at all? What you see, and if you get your hand on this science, this I believe is in the late 1990s, there's a whole issue of science on complex systems. And they refer to and define complex adaptive systems. And what you see in red is the essence. Simplicity at the higher level, chaos at the lower level. And bring in the notion of how essentially the way human beings evolve over the life course tends to be nonlinear and tends to feed into the notion of progressive entropy as defined by the second law of thermodynamics. And the reason this notion of complex systems is important is when we advise our patients to stop smoking. Now, tobacco control is a complex system. Whether or not the person stops smoking is an individual decision, but there are societal forces related to not only individual behavior, the behavior of the tobacco industry, the macroeconomic policies, government regulation, tobacco control programs. So when we are trying to tinker and asking somebody to do something, you're actually tinkering with a complex system that often tends to self-correct itself, but that's the nature of complex system. And this slide expands the same thing, the same complex adaptive system in the notion of obesity and undernutrition. This is the famous Lancet Commission on Nutrition and again, when we advise our patients to lose weight, you are feeding into a complex adaptive system with multiple feedback loops, which can be extraordinarily challenging to circumvent at an individual level, especially if there is no agency. Agency. That brings us to the story of the richest country on the planet. And this is a landmark article by Chris Murray, who just looked at the hardest of outcomes, mortality in the US. And this is an old paper, it's about 10 years old. And what he basically showed a map of the US is that depending on where you live in the US, what's the gap in life expectancy? And it's a staggering 14 year difference in mortality, in life expectancy. If you lived in what's referred to as black middle America or the Southern low, in, low economic rural black. In other words, 
This brought in the notion that maybe the zip code is more important or at least as important as the genetic code. And what you see on this slide is actually a map of the United States. We could, I have similar slides for almost every country. And what this shows is a period from 1989 to 2014, what you see in green is equity. What you see in brown is inequity, high poverty. And as you move from 1989 to 2014, you see the progressive browning of America, if you will. The top 10% in the United States has control of about 80% of the wealth. The top 1% controls about 32% of the wealth. Why does it matter? Because geography and inequity seems to determine risk, CBD risk, CBD mortality risk, and what you see over here in the heartland of the US is the highest rates of cardiovascular disease. The stroke belt, the diabetes belt, the obesity belt, the hypertension belt. Remember the notion of syndemics? This is context. So what has happened in cardiovascular disease as we have dealt with these landmark paradigm shifting uh, changes, a lot of refinements have happened about refining risk at the individual level. And the notion over here is one of the exposome, again popularized, and the term was coined by Steve Rappaport. Exposome is you know, what happens to us throughout our life course. What you eat, what you breathe, what you touch, all of that translates into some biological changes within you. And that's captured by the exposome. And some of the efforts are on to build what's called as the exposome atlas. Polygenic risk scores, whole genome sequencing, very much in vogue in the United States where genomic basis of health and risk, including CVD risk, is a common area for research. And that refers to what I refer to as fortune, that which you were born with. Clearly showing that the power of the genome is that if you were to look at quantiles of risk and you compare the top quantile with the lowest quantile, the relative risk could be as much as four, which approximates that of Mendelian disorders suggesting that if you harness the power of the genome, you really could risk stratify people. But how does the genome express itself? And that leads us to the ability to measure at an individual level, what we refer to as a multiomics profile. You could measure your circulating proteome, your metabolome, in short term, your fluxome, and be able to see how you respond to the exposome and be able to impact your trajectory towards health, if you're able to understand how born with a particular genome, you are exposed to the exposome and you translate that into the phenome through the intermediate steps of the metabolome and the proteome. Another area where phenotyping has really become very rich is the notion of the quantified self. Our ability to measure the phenome has exponentially increased. And just to give you an example over here, you see physical activity and the granularity with which we can account for how much time you spend doing exactly what activity, because all physical activity may not have equivalent cardiovascular or health benefits. So our ability to actually deep phenotype the physiome, here's an example of just physical activity, but it extends into your monitoring your heart rate, monitoring your rhythm, monitoring your oxygen saturation, so our ability to probe the physiome has really increased and we are beginning to marry it to the phenome to begin to understand and unpack the notion of risk over the short run, over the intermediate run and over the long run. So I want to pause over here and reflect upon fortune, the genome and exposome. And it turns out where the two meet is often what's referred to as the Waddington's landscape. That's a notion of how you're born with something and your life is like a rock that goes down a hill and it gathers a lot of moss. And by the time that stone or the pebble reaches the bottom of the hill, it's a different pebble from the one that rolled initially because it's gathered a lot of things. And that marriage or interface between nature and nurture is the epigenome. And here's a very good example. It's called the Dutch famine birth cohort study. It was called the hunger winter in uh, at the time of World War II, where it was the German blockade of the Dutch food distribution system. This is a group of people who were basically starved and were basically digging food and roots to eat tubers. 
And a lot of the people born in that era, when they grew up to be adults and they had children, their children were stunted. And one of the classic examples of that is uh, supposed to be Audrey Hepburn. Uh, she was in the Netherlands at the time and she died prematurely and could never gain weight. And the notion here was that the nurture part actually starts affecting your nature or your genome because the epigenetic changes made to your DNA because of environmental exposures that not only impact your course, but that are actually heritable and transmissible to subsequent generations. So that brings in the blend of nature and nurture joining together to determine risk. How does it all, what does it all mean and how do we operationalize it? And I want to give you just one particular example of a journey that I launched just about two and a half years ago. And this is referred to as the rural cohort study and the good fortune of designing and leading it. Uh, this refers to an investigation of the American heartland, the stroke belt, diabetes belt, the obesity belt, the health disparity populations. It's a collaboration of about 16 institutions. And some of these health disparity populations are remote and rural. It will take you a day to reach them. And the only way you can do is you take the science to the people. So that's what we call as the Rural Mobile Examination Unit. It's got the fastest CT scanner in the country. It's got an uh, echo machine that uses AI and can be operated by an untrained technician. It's got a mobile lab with uh, use of technology. And the participants in this study get uh, smartphones and they also get Fitbits so that we can profile them no differently than we do in the framing and study. So I want to step back and recap for you some of the main things that I hope I tried to illustrate for you. That when you see a patient in your outpatient and you're dealing with the hypertension or cholesterol, that's not when the story began. That risk is best understood from a transdisciplinary multi-level framework, the time, place, person context. Because that risk within that individual actually nests within a sociological hierarchy which tends to be a complex adaptive system. I hope based on what I've shared with you, I'm able to convince you that the determinants of disease in individuals is distinct from the determinants of disease in the populations from a perspective of primary prevention. And the determinants of disease in that population may not be the same as segments of those population that are more vulnerable, the health disparity populations. That in order to impact risk both at a community level and at an individual level, you need a multi-sectoral targeted participatory approach that deals with structural processes, macro social policy, cultural factors and societal factors. I also shared with you an era of excitement and we have to see how it develops about research, about measuring new measures of risk at the individual level, characterizing the phenomes, the genomes, the disease homes, if you will. I want to capture that in this slide. And this is the essence of my talk that risk nests within individuals, within biological hierarchies as you move from organ systems to cells to the DNA. Risk nests within sociological hierarchies because the individual is ensconced within communities, within families, within society. I want to pause here and again acknowledge the op opportunity to share with you some of these thoughts. I want to again thank my teachers who are on this call and some who are not on this call for really contributing to my growth and being the inspiration that makes me get out of bed every day. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now it is time to felicitate the orator. Uh, to do the honor, may I request uh, Professor Anita, Anita Saxena, Dean Academic, uh, to present the okay. award to the audience. Thank you, Dr. Vasan. I don't know if you're able to see this. We will hopefully be able to send this over to you at some point. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And this is a shared award for all the people on this Zoom and all the people who are not on Zoom and all the patients who taught me how to be a physician. Thank you.
Dr. Kothari, up here, sir. And this is this is the plot that we'll somehow get it over to you. Or when you are coming to India, do let us know. Thank you. We are coming to end of uh, this uh, program of oration today. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Ambuj Roy to deliver the vote of thanks, please. Uh, all good things <laughs> have come to an end. And it's an indeed an honor for me uh, to uh, present the vote of thanks. I must start by thanking Professor Vasan on an excellent talk, uh, all encompassing, starting from uh, individual risk to population risk, starting from basic phenotypes to multi-omics. <laughs> You, I thought, very well covered all the aspects of cardiovascular concepts of risk as it was your uh, as, as was the title of your talk. Uh, thank you uh, again for this excellent talk, and I'm sure it's must, it has put everybody here, everybody who listening on YouTube, a lot of food for thought and concepts for future research. Uh, I must also thank all the uh, um, seniors, my teachers and uh, all the stalwarts on the Zoom, uh, and all the attendees here in this uh, boardroom. Uh, I must thank uh, Professor Saxena, uh, Professor Kothari, for, to have chaired this session, uh, and uh, the academic section for conducting this uh, excellent uh, oration. And uh, last but not with the least, the, the team, the digital team who made this uh, possible to conduct this very smoothly, this session on uh, uh, on YouTube and on digitally. Thank you, everybody.